Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. When the road ahead is uncertain, there's no wiser choice than to listen to those with experience who have seen enough market cycles to judge what's most likely to happen next. Today, we're fortunate to welcome financial advisor Ted Oakley, managing partner and founder of Oxbow Advisors. Ted has over 40 years experience helping clients, mostly high net worth families, protect and build wealth through good times and bad. And here at the start of 2023, we'll ask him if the bear market is over or if it's simply sharpening its claws waiting to strike again. And we'll find out how he's currently positioning his clients' assets for the coming year. Ted, it's wonderful to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Adam. Ted, um, it's always a great pleasure to interview you. Um, folks uh, constantly ask me to bring you back on the program. Uh, your wisdom, experience, and just ways to explain things in a very matter-of-fact way that the average person can understand is really appreciated by this audience. I have a lot of questions for you, largely based upon the recent uh, Q1 um, update that you put out for your clients. Uh, but before we start walking through that, if I can just maybe kick things off here with a high-level question I like to ask you every time you come on, what is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, Adam, I think uh, what's going to happen here is we there's a few there's a few things getting ready to fall that hadn't fallen before, which were earnings, uh, and I think that's going to have a major impact. I think people are not factoring in the weakness that's coming from these companies earnings wise, and I think that's going to have to be priced in at some point in time. So we look for the market to go to new lows. Uh, I don't know what that number is necessarily, but it's certainly not. I don't think it's where it is now. And we've had this, uh, you know, all year long, we've had this obsession with trying to catch the low in the market and the high in the rates so we could front run everybody. But they don't work that way. That's not the way things really shake out in the long run in a bear market. And so we'll see how it plays out. But for us right now, we just think that's where we're headed over the next few quarters. Okay, um, so some more additional shoes to drop, but but more importantly, the question I put in the intro sounds like you think the bear is is just sitting on the side right now, sharpening his claws, uh, coming back, and will bring the market to new lows at some point in twenty twenty three. I do. One one of the things I've noticed is that by and large, investors haven't gotten scared enough. It's interesting to us; they've lost money. But they've been, I don't know if they've been talked into it by Wall Street that, hey, everything's okay, so just just stay with everything or what it is. But typically, uh, you will have to get enough damage in those portfolios to where they finally say, hey, look, I'm out. I'm at least out a part of it. And that we haven't seen that yet. It's been an interesting turn for us this year. All right. And, and you've got a chart in your update that we'll get to in a bit that shows that people are still pretty pretty all in the market and positioned long that they, even if they're talking uh, a more cautious game, they're not putting their money where their mouth is yet. They're still investing like it's a bull market. Um, all right. Well, look, um, like I said, you you put together recently a great update for your investors. Um, I want to share some of the highlights of that if possible for folks uh, watching this video here. Um, uh, let's see. Um, it's interesting in, in that, in that presentation, I don't think I heard you mention the word pivot once. And of course that seems to be what so much of the market is glued to right now is, is, is there an indication the fed's going to do a massive pivot sooner than later? And, and, and we'll be able to ride, you know, a resurgence in asset prices because people are equating pivot with, with immediate higher prices and everything, which, which may or may not be the case in, in reality, even if one does happen. Um, but you did say that you think 2023 will likely uh, see, or maybe we've already even seen, uh, the peak for both interest rates and CPI. And on the day you and I are talking here, they just released uh, the December CPI numbers, which are showing that we do seem to be now in a pretty identifiable disinflationary trend. Um, so I'll let you talk about that. Um, is that truly the case? You think we've seen a peak in both? Well, what what we were referring to on rates was not the short-term rates, not less two years and less, but but the long-term rate, really. Because if you look back, the rate, the long-term rates, I'm talking about 20 to 30, they peaked a while back, uh, you know, and they've come off since then. Not to say they couldn't go back, but we don't think they will. 
And we're talking about long-term rates when I say that we think the rates are big. And we think, you know, inflation, I don't know, was nine points back in uh, June, July. And obviously that's rolled over. But people have to remember that all of that takes place while the economy is tanking. Right. So as you go lower and those numbers get worse, then that means you're headed more and more into a recession. And then that I think that's what they fail to understand on all of this. And uh, from for us, we just think that um, perhaps they're getting this wrong and that maybe this time uh, Jay Powell is in a mode where he's saying, hey, look, I wanted to get rid of this thing where the Federal Reserve is always the one driving the bus here. And so we don't want to just run liquidity in and, and support the stock market. May be wrong on that, but he seems to be going that direction. If, in fact, that's the case, then, yes, your rates, the long-term rates can stay there or come down, and, and, and you can have um, CPI coming down as well. I do disagree with people that think that the short-term rates are based on the bonds because uh, if you want to see those two-year rates keep going up, watch him just keep raising those rates, and the bonds won't go against that. You know, they'll buy the Treasury. So we'll see how plan pans out, but we're talking about that's what we're looking at right now on top of that. Okay. Um, and, and a good clarification. So short-term rates probably will actually go up a little bit more uh, from here, simply if, if Powell's to be believed that he's going to stick to his plan. Um, and I'll ask this question, even though it wasn't so much in, in your presentation. You know, Powell has said, I want to get up to around 5%, and then I want to hold it there for a good while to assess the impact of all the rate hikes we've done so far as they, you know, with their delay, begin to really hit the economy. Um, we have recently had Jamie Dimon saying, well, there's a 50% chance the Fed might need to go higher than 5%, maybe up to 6 And we had the trial balloon that James Bullard floated last week saying, I don't know, we might need to go up to 7 um, but it sounds like you're saying, and correct these words if they're wrong, yes, that may play out a bit over maybe Q1, half one of this year, rates going a bit higher still from here um, But you know, in the short term. But you don't really necessarily see a clear trigger for why long-term rates should rise back up to the highs they were at you know, a few months back. Well, it doesn't look like it. It looks like the inversion of that curve is just going to get larger. Mm -hmm. Or you might even go to 1% or something where the short rates are 1% higher than the long. It could very well be that way. And I, I do think I don't think people need to understand that if you look at the Fed funds rate, I don't think they I don't think they stop that until that at least squares up with inflation. So it's four and a half right now. Inflation six, six one, whatever it was today. You know, you you're still out of balance right now. So uh, one, either one comes down a lot or the other one goes up more than they think. We'll, we'll have to see. Okay. And, and you said that you think that um, as a number of other folks that I've interviewed here, um, it's been interesting over the course of the year, a lot of the experts I interviewed on this channel really didn't think the Fed was going to be able to get as far as it's been able to get so far with, with uh, hiking interest rates. Um, but uh, you and, and several others now think that that, that that Powell's real main focus here is I don't want to be another Arthur Burns, right? I don't want to have us go through the, the period we went through in the 70s where they, they raised rates, inflation began coming down, so they brought rates down, and then they got another resurgence of inflation. So Powell, and again, don't let me put words in your mouth here, but it sounds like you think Powell is going to do what's necessary policy-wise until he really has confidence that that inflation is is stamped out. Well, you know, what happened during that period is right in the middle of the 70s, when you got that 73, when you got that big push on inflation. And of course, they raised the rates. And, and so it busted, it busted things back into the 73, 74 recession. It was a bad recession. So they came again with it, you know, loosened up too much. They didn't let it, you know, ferret itself out. And so what that did, then that pushed it to a new high, Arthur Burns is out, Volk, uh, you know, uh, Paul Volcker's in, and then he has to really bite the bullet. And I'm thinking that Jay Powell is trying not to have to get into that situation. All right. So um, my guess is you would you would say to the the people just salivating for a pivot, um, you know, you've got maybe more confidence in Powell's backbone than they do. Um, and then another thing I'd love for you to comment on is. 
is if something were to force a pivot, let's say something really bad broke and it just bad enough that it forced Powell to, to really have to reverse policy sooner than he wanted to. I don't think that's going to be a bullish moment for stocks. That's going to be a crisis in the markets, right? You're exactly right. What happens on those and people, I think people that don't know a lot of history about the markets don't understand this, but if he came within the next few months, this couple of months, and started lowering the rate, he was not going to lower the rates first. He'll keep them flat. But he, when they start lowering, that means they're fearful of things that are already happening badly, okay? And then the markets react just like you're saying. They react poorly. See, all of that's ahead. We, don't, we haven't even stopped going up yet. And that means we haven't flattened out yet. And we certainly haven't started going down. So I have no idea why Wall Street is so consumed with this. I mean, they're consumed daily with it. And uh, I, I think they've really gotten it all wrong. All right. Um, and it wouldn't be the first time, right? Um, so <laughs> <laughs> going through your, continuing through your macro outlook. Um, so you said, yeah, so sort of expect interest rates to peak, um, certainly in the long term, but probably still in the short term as well, it, it, short term rates at some point in 2023. Inflation probably has peaked. We're watching it come down now. Um, you said that the the economic news you believe is only going to degrade uh, as we go further into the first half of the year here. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, we'll put up this chart here, uh, the ISM purchasing managers charts uh, have gone into negative territory, which shows that um, you know we're, we're now in contraction uh, in the manufacturing space in terms of spending. Um, but is all this true that you just sort of consider, you, you look ahead and just see this continued sort of just grinding down of, of growth and opportunity in the, in the economy? Well, I think so. And, and actually, just since we put that out, you know, the services came out, Ironside services came out well, and they went into negative ter territory. And I think most people don't realize that this, Adam, but wholesale drives the market, not so much retail. If you look at what drives the, the market, typically in the ISM, it's wholesale. And what that tells you is that the whole, that the people that are producing, manufacturing, et cetera, they're saying, hey, you know, business is slower. We're not buying as much. So that's where we're headed. And I think I think it may it may be the third or fourth quarter. I, I don't know. But I, I, my guess is at some time in, in the first one to three quarters uh, that you start to really see that take effect. OK, and I don't think you address this in your update, but but in regards to that, where wholesale really drives is, is you know, is, is the dog and, and the rest is the tail. What's your forecast for layoffs, right? As, as companies get increasingly squeezed, um, in, the economy contracts further from here. Are you concerned that we could see wide scale layoffs that the sort we've seen in, in past substantial recessions? You know, that's, that's, Adam, that's probably one of the hardest things to figure this time, because we dropped a lot of people out of the group. Now, I do think they're going to have layoffs. I mean, it's going to continue and it's going to get tougher. The thing about it is, and I know if you look at most small businesses and they and the good employees they have, they will ride with those longer than normal because they know they can't rehire somebody as good as that person. You know, I'm involved in, in three or four businesses. And the thing about them is you try to keep your good people, even if it costs you more money than you normally would spend. And so that's a really hard thing, though, to uh, figure. It's hard to figure out actually how many of those would do that. We think a number would, but it the unemployment will go up. I think unemployment has to go up or he keeps the, you know, the pedal to the metal here. Uh, I think that's one of the things he looks at. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, uh, you uh, mentioned sort of what served you, you at Oxbow well last year, was assuming a defensive position pretty early in the year. Um, and kudos to you for that because it was not a good year. <laughs> it was a, for the markets, it was one of the worst ever for both stocks and bonds combined. So defense really paid off. Uh, sounds like we'll, we'll get into the specifics of your allocation later on, uh, but it sounds like you are maintaining that defensive posture coming into to 2023 here. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, last year, uh, the, the commodity side of your portfolio did quite well, um, specifically natural gas, oil, and gold. 
Um, I think you've kept on the natural gas and the, the gold, but you've sold off some of your oil position, I think. Can you just very briefly explain why? Well, the the reason we, and it was probably came across a little bit differently in that uh, what we sold was the, 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 the big oils. You know, if you look at uh, Devon or Chevron and um, th- those kinds of things, what we kept were oil royalties. If you look at, you know, what we kept, CTO, Permian Base, those kinds of things, uh, Texas Pacific, if you own the oil royalty and you're wrong on the oil, you'll still be right on the royalty, you see. And we get cash flow, better cash flow on the royalties than we get on the big oil. And we really felt like oil was coming down and it has come down. And so, uh, but we're still getting good, we're still getting good payments on the royalty side. So that was a, not to make people think we don't think, uh, you know, we want some energy on the natural gas side. We kept the pipelines. We, we did not keep um, any of the straight gas companies because the pipelines are different in that they get paid on throughput. So we'll pay, we'll make that cash flow no matter you know, we're obviously at a very low price right now on an MCF basically on, on natural gas, but they still get paid and we still get paid. So that's how we that's how we set that up for those two things. OK, and I'm just curious, since we're on the topic, um, trying to map oil, oil's investment outlook to a slowing economy. Um do you have a strong sense of where you think oil prices are going to head in 2023 because the economy is slowing down? Well, you're, you're weak worldwide, um, with exception maybe a few countries that are starting to come out. But the, the people forget about this. And I totally agree with them on the supply look, uh, demand look on oil long term. But short term, you know, oil is coming off for a reason. And everybody asks me this question all the time. Well, why do you think it's coming down? I said, well, it's easy. They're front running a soft economy because mm-hmm. you don't use as much oil. And that's that's where it is. It doesn't mean that the supply is not still reasonably tight and things are going on. But if you're not buying it, the price is going to go down. And so that's as you go into these weak economic times, you look for oil to, you know, to come off. That's all we're doing. And it's probably one of those things where we're out of it for maybe a year or so, uh, and we'll be back. Uh, I'm talking about the big oil now. Yeah. And I want to remind our viewers that your firm, Oxbow Advisors, is based in Austin, Texas. Um, In other words, you have a very close proximity uh, to the oil economy of Texas. I'm assuming a number of your clients uh, work in the industry. So in other words, you're pretty close to the heartbeat of what happens in the oil market. Um, you're, you're not just kind of reading the papers and, and, and guessing. You're actually talking to people who have a lot of firsthand knowledge of what's going on in that market. And you've you've invested in it for decades and have a really good sense of, of how the trends work. Well, I do. I, I will tell you, uh, though, oil and gas people that are in the industry are not, they're, they're sort of, a, I use them as a contrarian group. Because <laughs> they're parentally optimistic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when the price is really high, they think it's going, it has to go higher. And when it gets really, really low, they think it has to go lower. I'll tell you just a quick funny story. And this was Please. back in the, that was, this, <laughs> this was back in, uh, it must have been 98 or 99. I mean, it was one of those periods here where oil went below $10, okay? And so a couple of times I talked to producers and I said, um, I said, uh, how much does it cost you per barrel to lift that, you know? And they gave me a number and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was 50% more than the price of a barrel was in the open market. And so this is how they think. And so they, I said, well, why don't you just go buy it? And they said, well, because it might go lower. <laughs> and so <laughs> do you see what I mean? I mean, that's I that, that, that you got to think about that. And so that's, that's how they, they, they're, 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 they're a group that uh, they, they, they can't take the deep lows or the high highs. It's tough on them. All right. Um, well, uh, look forward to Ted, you know, when you see the, um, uh, you know, the, the winds of change blowing uh, that's going to make you want to get back into the big oil majors, please have you come back on the uh, the channel here and we can have you explain why. Um, all right. Well, in, in kind of rounding out your macro outlook, um, you said that, uh, 
you know, not only are um, we seeing signs like the ISM numbers that that the economy is slowing, uh, but we are seeing that goods prices are coming down. Um, and, and again, today's uh, uh, latest CPI numbers uh, do bear that out. Um, uh, and that uh, it's it's funny, even though right now in, in, in today's numbers, again, um, one of the biggest contributors on the upside to to the CPI is is housing still that's very lagging data and if we look at a lot of the other more real time data it's very clear that the national housing market is beginning to roll over here um i assume you you have that same outlook um and so i want to ask you how substantial do you think this this housing correction could be once it gets fully underway you know it's a bifurcated market because adam what's happening is uh it I suspect in in the big picture, when it's all said and done, I would suspect that housing prices generally would come off 15, 20%. That's just a, I'm just throwing it out because that's what I would expect. And the primary reason is because if you look at where people are locked in to existing home, you know, most of those mortgages are below 4%, and a lot of them are at three, and some are at two and a half. And so when it starts up this mobility thing, they're going to have to lower the price to move that house if they have to move to another city. Right. Or let's say they have a couple of children now and they've got to you know, expand. All of that works into a problem because you have all this group over here with really, really low pricing that has to be working in a market with really high pricing and the two don't fit together. And that's why I think... Uh, people are, are, are talking that way, you know, uh, and now we've seen it too in luxury homes. Uh, you know, uh, Finn, we, I brought this out in the call, this, the, 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 the quarterly call we had, but one of the things that Redfin came out and said, Hey, year to year, luxury homes down 38% as far as, you know, and so they are selling. And that's, that's what we're noticing too. We used to, everybody used to tell us, Oh, they've got cash or buying for cash won't hurt that market. Well, didn't happen that way because I'm seeing more and more, even of our own clientele who have housing that's anywhere from three to 15 million, they can't sell them. Yeah. They don't even, some of them don't even get a look. Nobody walks in. So we're in the midst of that right now. And they're just going to, you know, we have to deal with it as we go through this, this period. It, it, let me tug at this a little bit further, Ted, because one of the pushbacks I hear from folks, um, on the topic of the market's going to decline substantially or not, as they say, hey, people have these really cheap mortgages, they're just not going to move, right? And so they're just going to wait this out. But what people forget, or what I what I think they're forgetting, is that housing is priced at the margin. And that means you only need one or two houses in a neighborhood to sell to reprice all the homes in the neighborhood, right? And there's always going to be some percentage of sales in any market, just because people die, people get divorced, people lose their jobs, people have to move for other personal reasons, right? So there's always going to be some transaction volume there that is going to be doing the marginal price resetting. So I'm just curious, do you, do you, do you share that opinion that people are, are, are maybe not paying enough attention to that dynamic? I think that's totally true, because the other thing they miss is that you've gone through a couple of years of extremely high uh, home, home taxes. And so now taxes are so high and see that goes on top of the payment right. and people are not realizing that, you know, it's, it, if you look at it today and I, I've got a number on this cause I pulled it before, but if you buy a new home today, uh, the average person in the United States would have to spend over 45% of their income just on the, on the home. <laughs> and so that's not, that won't work. It just won't work. I mean, you can't make that work long-term. So, Something has to happen, and I think it slows down the industry. Um, you know, the real estate industry has always been, and believe me, take, let me tell you this. I love real estate. I think it's one of the great investments, by the way. But uh, And I've owned it, and we own it, and you know, we different things. But here's the problem. People are um, they're more enamored with real estate than anything else. Most people think that very little can happen to real estate. Well, I've been through periods where... A lot of things happen to real estate, and, and I'll just throw this out. These letters, RTC, if you'll remember that, that was a period where you could buy everything on the cheap, cheap, really cheap, okay? And it, it, they come and go. They're not as much as a stock market, but they have their periods, and I think we're coming into one. 
Okay. Yeah, I, I would almost say, and you don't have to share this opinion, but like right now, if you're talking about a residential house, and look, of course, any particular geography is unique and location, 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 all that stuff. You can still find some good values in some little pockets. But in general, in today's housing market, um, again, for the consumer, I think this has got to be almost one of the worst moments in time to buy a house because prices haven't really corrected yet from their all-time highs. And but mortgage rates are more than double where they were, you know, a year and a half ago, right? So you're kind of almost getting the worst of both worlds, the, the highest price and the highest financing costs. You know, and that is so true. And I think people forget about this. But these municipalities and state and counties have been on a free ride, okay, in 21 and 22. And so I'll just give an example. I own property in Wyoming. They never go up very much in tax. They double the taxes in, 20, in, go, in 22, double them, 100%. And so what happens is you, these, these cities and counties and states, all of a sudden, they're on a free ride here. Now, that's another thing. When you go to sell that home, they look at, okay, I've got this interest rate. I got to pay this price. And on top of that, I have to pay this much in tax. Right. Those, all of those things factor into a slower market, in our opinion. Okay. So I, I imagine you would say patience. Um, you're probably going to say this about the, the financial markets too, but in, in terms of the housing market for those folks who are looking to buy real estate, my guess is you would say patience is your friend in 2023. It is. I remember, uh, you know, a year ago or longer, I would tell people, and it was red hot everywhere, especially here in Austin, but everywhere else that I, we, we go all over the country. So it was red hot. And I would just tell people, hey, just wait on it. You know, things don't stay that way forever. And they'll break down on you sooner, sooner or later. Uh, you know, and everybody was like, well, we can't do this, can't do that. Now it's starting to happen. And uh, but it's probably just start, probably just starting. I think people in reality, they really don't believe it. That's one of the things I'm finding about the, about the real estate market, too. Yeah, well, it sounds like, you know, many things uh, people go through the five stages of grief. Right. And the first one, I think, is denial. Right. It takes you a while before you really are willing to accept it's happening. Right. Yeah, I, I, I know in Austin, actually, I was interviewing housing analyst Nick Jurley uh, last month. And he brought up the, the most recent housing sales and then housing price data and, and housing sales, you know, have have cratered. They're down like 40 to 50 percent in most major metros from the prior year. But but housing price declines were already beginning to pick up and leading the pack was Austin, Texas. And it was a 15 percent decline just from May to November. That was the data set that we were looking at. I'm sure it's even worse now. So your advice for people, you know, in Austin who are asking you to say, hey, maybe maybe wait a little bit has already turned out to, uh, to be very prescient advice. I'm also really curious too, the last time I was, I was in Austin, actually visiting you on that trip, Ted, um, I was staying in a place where out one window, I could see a um, building that was just being finished that Google was building. And then another building that was still under construction that Facebook was building. These were pretty big buildings in downtown Austin. And since then, those companies have both announced either hiring freezes or, or, or you know, substantial staff cuts. Um, is anything happening with those buildings? Are they just, just going to sit vacant for a while? Or what, what's going on there? Because you've been at sort of the hotbed, the, the tip of the spear of, of the speculative you know, fervor in big tech there in Austin. Well, I, I don't know about Google, but I do know about Facebook because it's public knowledge now uh the 23 floors they had in the new building here i believe it's 23 uh they are not going to build out right now so they could either uh they could either elect to sublease it or they could do nothing till they decide what to do but either way you know it's it's creating you know empty offices and i don't have this number because i haven't done all the work on this but i believe right now that downtown austin probably has more square foot for lease than they've ever had and of course they have two very very large buildings coming out of the ground as well so and we've got a number of buildings coming out so there's a lot of space around if somebody wants some Wow. And, and you know that gets exacerbated by the whole work from home you know movement that started uh from the pandemic but also as you said we're here at the start of the year. You believe, at least for the next half of the year, but maybe potentially even further, we're going to see continued economic weakness, maybe further layoffs, as we mentioned earlier. So it just it doesn't bode very well for a lot of vacant commercial office space. 
That's true. All right. Well, look, um, uh, uh, let's move on to you, you. You did a section on bonds. You did a section on stocks. So on bonds, um, you very rightly, as I've been saying a lot on this channel, uh, that higher interest rates have been killing borrowers, right? Uh, both on the consumer side and on the corporate side. And because of that, um, it sounds like you sort of expect to see a certain reckoning, you know, a certain die off amongst the weaker, more over leveraged players um, in, in the corporate system. I see you nodding as I'm saying this, but um, how, how substantial do you think that could that get? Well, I will say this about a lot of the corporations. They were smart enough at least to take those you know, really small, you know, short rates, uh, small, uh, the rates when they were really low and kick that paper out a long way. And the problem is we had so many of those companies that were just living on a string on basically floating rate debt. That's the killer. Because if we roll over here, if that floating rate debt was at a two or some of them were actually at a one and a half or something like that, they're going to a seven so or higher. So all of a sudden, that's what you get into. Um, it's been hard to get a number on that because there's a lot of mezzanine debt that it's hard to get a, hard to get a number on. It. You, you can see what's on balance sheets and different things at companies, but the public companies, but there's a lot of debt out there on private equity, on private companies, real, all various things that's really floating. And that to me is where the problem's coming in. All right. You know, I've heard people say, look, if, if we do indeed get a recession this year, you know, it's not going to be as systemically bad as 2008 was because, you know, we don't have the crazy housing loans that were being made, right? And and uh, and there was enough housing debt and enough portfolios out there that it created this big contagion effect. And, and that's true. But we have all debt re-rating at these substantially higher rates. So it is kind of a universal injury to everybody that uses credit, which is the you know just about everybody in the <laughs> in the economy these days. You have a great chart here that that just underscores how much bond yields have jumped uh, in the past um, one year. Right now, um, you know when you look at it from bond yields, we can look at it as, as an attractive uh, from an attractive perspective as an investor, but but it also reflects. The, the huge jump that just interest rates in debt have taken on. And so the cost of capital has gotten so much higher for corporate America. Um, so maybe I'll put that chart up here and Ted, you can talk to it any way that you like. But um, I just kind of liken this in some ways to, uh, you know, throwing somebody into the Arctic Ocean, right? It's you can die from the shock because you're 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 getting chilled so quickly. I mean, we're 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 kind of having a debt sh or we're in danger of having a debt shock to the system here, correct? From how quickly and how high rates have changed. That is true. And it's in a lot of different areas, Adam. If you look at a lot of the leverage out there, whether it be on a private business, private equity, a lot of real estate. I mean, you know, a lot of multifamily. Not, not, that's that's been brought out the last five years, okay? And if you look at their structures, they'll typically have, you know, maybe 15, 20% equity, maybe 20% fixed, maybe 60% floating. And it was great for them for about five years. But now they're going to roll all of that over. Same way it, with all of these companies that are leveraged. And when they roll, it's going to really change the cash flow number. And that is the problem. Because then if you've got a lower cash flow number, you have to take a lower price. And I don't think people are thinking about that. I think they're sort of trying to uh, glass over that. And But if you look, if you look at it, though, that's what has to happen when you have lower cash flow. And that's what's coming from the higher rates. All right. So when you have this concern, I'm just worried, uh, curious, like what, what sort of DEF CON level do you place on it? I mean, how 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 big of a concern is this for you? Well, my I would guess, okay, this is a Ted Oakley guess, but my mm -hmm. guess is there will be more companies, public companies, go out of business this year than I've seen maybe ever, but in a long, long, long time, because number one, they're leveraged. Number two, so many of those public companies didn't have, didn't even have any revenue. And if they did, it was min minuscule. So those companies go away. And if you look at 
you just go look at, we don't own bond funds uh, in particular, but we really own straight bonds. But if you go look at a bond, a lot of bond funds, they'll jam a lot of triple B bond. I mean, a lot of triple B in there because it's investment grade. Mm -hmm. A lot of that paper probably is going to be um, then put down to, to double B single, maybe lower. And that way it's downgraded. When it gets downgraded, all of a sudden they have to kick those bonds out of whatever fund that was. And so, uh, that's a problem you're going to have too, because you won't have you won't have the buyers, and so that all of that's still coming, I think. And so that's why we mentioned to people, don't underestimate how safe you need to be, because you can be in a lot of bonds that are not safe at all. Uh, that's a great point to underscore, and you know more people are waking up to bonds. I would say this year, um, we've certainly had more conversations about bonds over the past four months than I've probably had in my life. Um, and there's lots of good reasons for that. And I, I know, I believe, Ted, you know, your 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 firm is is pretty um, bond friendly right now, given the environment. But it very much depends on what type of bonds uh, we're talking about here. And I'll give you a chance when we talk about your portfolio allocation to talk about the specific type of bonds that you're going into here. Um so uh, I do want to underscore, though, that that um, I believe, and again, correct me if if, if I'm not stating this properly, but um, you know, bonds are they are looking quite attractive uh, in a number of cases here, and especially when you look at the bond yields we have today as compared to the dividend yields of the stock market. You know, the past decade there was sort of the mantra of there is no alternative, right, Tina? Um, well, now bonds are beginning to offer. An attractive alternative because you can basically get a similar or maybe even sometimes superior uh, yield or cash flow with a ton more safety than a lot of today's equities offer you. Correct? That's true. And one of the things that people, I think they make an error in this respect in that they, most people really, and particularly individuals, don't. They don't know what is in a bond fund. They don't know what's in it, and they don't have any idea of duration or the quality or anything like that. They just somebody just tells them you need to own bonds, okay? But think about this: if you have a, a period like we think over the next ten years, where it will not be like the last twelve, and you really don't know exactly what's going to happen with inflation, interest rates, and all of that, it could go back to two. It could go to six. You know who knows. What I'm trying to say is if if I were advising most individuals, I would have to say, why don't you just think about it like this? Why don't you think about keeping that treasury look first time ever that savings is back and you can do, you know, you can do something from a 470 on the shortest end to five years out, you know, still at a four. And all of a sudden you're creating a really great cash flow with very little risk, by the way. It, they're not, not to say there's not any. And then give yourself a chance to look at it the next two or three or four years to see how's this thing panning out? Why do people have to go out and try to guess what the Fed's going to do? And we're going to buy those long bonds and take a bet. I just don't think it makes sense. All right. Well, you know, and that is the name of the game in terms of wealth building over time, Ted, right? Is it's, it's you know, try to avoid taking the the unnecessary risks that set you back if your thesis goes against you and and you know try to have a uh, an attractive but um you know uh, risk balance way just to keep growing as consistently as you can over time so I, I love that reminder and on the point of bonds um folks if you're watching if you if you're taking to heart what Ted's saying um and if you're like most people uh, very well, you may never have bought a, a bond directly yourself. Uh, I hear a lot of times from people you know, who watch these videos who, who just say, I'm kind of interested in this topic, but I just don't know much about it. I uh, want to remind folks that we did a, a really good uh, kind of primer on understanding bonds and how they work um, two months ago with Mike Leibowitz from uh, Real Investment Advisors. Uh, gosh, it's about an hour presentation with another hour, hour and a half of him answering questions from the audience. So if you want to go watch that totally for free, just go to wealthion.com slash bonds, a free, very useful resource for you there. Um, all right. Well, look, um, regarding bonds and interest rates, um, sort of switching over into to stocks now, but um, you have a chart here showing um 
interest rates and and stock prices and basically saying, you know, the stock market's had a 40 year tailwind that it's been able to enjoy, right? It's just had this, this secular trend of lower and lower interest rates that fueled a lot of the capital flowing into the equity markets, made, you know, credit money really cheap for companies to borrow, buy, invest, buy back their shares with, et cetera. And you can see what happened with stock prices as a result. But now you, your chart shows that that secular decline may be over. Um, and, uh, you know, we we could, a reasonable person could expect that relationship to continue, but it, it's now just going to be inverted where, you know, if interest rates uh, are, are higher going forward, uh, than they have been in the past couple of decades, uh, that we would expect equity prices not to be as well supported. Um, so can you just opine a little bit more about what you expect there? Well, I think people forget, or at least they don't uh, give credit where credit's due, and that is with a declining interest rate environment over this whole 40-year, and that's a long time, a 40-year period, then you know, it's it's been hard not to make things work. I mean, anything, uh, real estate, private equity, private business, anything you invested in, stocks, bonds, everything had that going for them because the cost of capital kept going down and down and down. And so let's say that you go into a period, and, and this happens in our business, where you have, a, you have a change, something changes, and you go into a time uh, where all of a sudden, let's say uh, we're going to stay around 3 or 4% inflation for the next 10 years. Maybe we go to two or maybe we go back to six and back to three. All of a sudden though, it's not that one and a half, two that was just stuck there for 10 years. You have to get in a position where you're starting to look at things now and what's that inflation rate going to have? What's the impact on my investments over a 10 year period? Let's just say it averages three and a half. Well, that's gonna impact me 40% probably in the end. And they forget about that. And I've, I've seen this before. I'll give you an example. People were so hung up on high interest rates from basically 1970 to 1982 that when they flipped the lid in August of 82 and rates started down, it took people three or four years to realize that, hey, there's a change going on here. And they stayed with the old system, what they were doing. And, they, and they, it took a long time for them to realize that, hey, it's not like it was, okay? And so that's that's sort of where I think we could be today. All right. And, and I think that that really underscores the value that a firm like yours brings you, your customers here, Ted, um, which is th the active management approach takes on a, a much more superior importance in, in the environment that you think we're heading into here, right? So, you know, with that with that tailwind at your back, um, with with the Fed being willing to intervene at any given moment uh, to you know protect investors from any bruises that the, the market might be trying to give them, um, anybody could make money. All boats were rising. You could basically throw a dart and and do fine. Um, in this new environment, it, it's not going to be that way. Um, in fact, it's going to be sort of inverted in terms of the trends. So you're really going to have to do your the gumshoe detective work of finding you know, the diamonds within each sector that are well-run, well-capitalized, have good growth prospects, and and really being able to um, sift the wheat from the chaff is is what's going to determine, much more importantly, who, who does well going forward. Um, so I just want to underscore, you know, I always say in this program, folks should work with a, a professional financial advisor who understands all these macro issues, but I think that's even more important given the type of environment that we're headed into. Well, it is for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you look going back to 09 until now, you know, these bear markets were five or six weeks long. So if I've been in the business less than, say, 14 years, that's what I saw until 22. And then I had to deal with, well, gosh, this thing's gone down all year. <laughs> and I, it's interesting because we, one of the probably that when we, we, you know, we have new money come into the firm and one of the things that we get told more than anything else really is, you know, I have all these exchange traded funds, et cetera, et cetera, but nobody's ever done anything. They just look at it. And I think that's a lot of what's going on on Wall Street today. They're just looking right. at it and thinking, you know, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. And that's normally not the case and <laughs> ever. So we'll, 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 we'll see how it pans out in the long run. 
Well, we've talked in the past, Ted, about this dynamic where you everybody's professional muscles are developed for the environment that they've, you know, built their careers in. Mm -hmm. And because we're at a secular shift, we may very well have the exact wrong musculature in our professionals than we need for what's going forward. Right. And to your point, like a lot of a lot of Wall Street, and I know this because I, I interact with a lot of um, capital managers and financial advisors, the, the way the model has mutated into over the past, you know, 10, 20 years of this hyper supported market is the skill set of most of these guys is marketing. It's getting the capital in the door. Yeah. Like I said, you can just have the monkey throwing darts in the back room in terms of the allocation, right? Um, so these guys are very good at knowing how to bring capital in, but they haven't really focused all that much on the management of it. You know, you're basically saying going forward, it's the management that's going to be really critical. Well, and I would tell you that say this to you because I've seen these ups and downs over you know forty five years, and what happens is in the industry, but I will say for sure since in the last thirteen or fourteen years, and I would compare it by the way to the residential real estate brokers. I think these two industries were on such a move that just kept going, going, going easily that you get all sorts of people in the business, both businesses, and they don't really know much about what they're doing. They just show up. <laughs> well, when times go bad, you got to know you have to know something, you know. And uh, I think that's where we are now. I think we we I think our our industry, by the way, has too many people in it. And uh, what it will do during these periods is you shake them out. And I've seen it before. You know, you 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 go your numbers go down, and I suspect that'll happen in residential real estate too. Uh, I completely agree. And and I mentioned my interview with Nick Jurley. He, I think right now is predicting about 30% of realtors will not renew their licenses during this downturn, that it's going to shake out about a third of the market. And I, I to me, that feels about right, similarly, in terms of the financial advisory space, too. And, and Ted, that's why I really appreciate being able to bring on guys like you. Uh, and of course, wealthy on endorsed advisors who come on this channel every week, so that people can at least get a, a view of, of, the type of advisor that I think is going to, you know, be uh, coincident with success going forward. And so they can get a sense of what to look for in the type of advisor, because you're a good model, in my opinion. You know, and there's another thing in there, Adam, I think people don't realize. And that is if, if you look at the, the fees that have been charged generally, okay, on top of, of um, mutual fund fees or exchange traded fees, then they'll put a management fee on top of that. If you look at that over the last 12 or 14 years, um, I, I, re I remember uh, greatly in a meeting when I was a younger guy and uh, and the person looked across the other guy that, that was making the presentation says, you know, it looks like to me the last three years you made more money than I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think some of that will go on. I think they'll look and say, you know, I, I'm paying a lot of money here. And I'm really exactly where I was five years ago as far as what I own. There has been, you know, nothing's changed. And uh, I see a lot of that coming to fruition here. Yeah. And one of the ways, I, reasons I love to have you on, on this program, Ted, is is you have the, the view of experience where, you know, so much of what everyone's wrestling with today, it's a rhyme of a theme we've seen earlier on in history, right? Which oh, sure. gives you confidence in terms of what to project. And so that your last comment there is a riff on the old joke that I think was made back in like the thirties of um, the, the, the broker showing the, um, his friend, uh, his yacht uh, in the Marina and uh, his friend asking, okay, but where are your client's yachts? Right. <laughs> Just I, basically. I, I still have the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where are, the right where are the customers' yachts? I still have that book. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So again, this is again just 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 a rhyme on that theme. Um, all right. Well, look. Um, heading over into stocks now. Um, uh, you, uh, you know, we, we we talked about how we just talked about how uh, you know if there is a secular shift in in interest rates and in um, bond yields and inflation, that that may be a sign the gravy train for, for stocks generally is, is ending. You also have uh, put up a chart about um, M2 money supply, showing as well that in, in your data set, which goes back to 1960, uh, every single year of the data set, money supply as measured by M2 increased, except for this last period. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of like things being different this time, this definitely seems to be a big one. 
Well, uh, and I have to say, uh, Adam, and, and you know our friend Lacey Hunt, I uh, ran that by Lacey because he's such a historian. I said, Lacey, am I right on this? And he came back and said, "You're yes, uh, you can use it. You're right, because we pull it off Federal Reserve. But the thing about that is, is people, this is what people don't realize. When you're pulling money out of the system and it, and you're going into a really tight money period, all of a sudden, that's underneath. You can't see that, but that's where you get into trouble because now you go get a loan or you go get some sort of financing and people are like, hey, you know what? We're out. We're out of the market. You know, And so that's the sort of thing that starts to happen. Like Wells Fargo uh, yesterday getting out of the uh, you're getting out of the housing mortgage market in a big, big way. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you start to have these people pull out. And I think people don't realize what happens. And if the Fed stays on the same rate they've been running at, by the time you get to April or May, you're going to be back at a point where they have really pulled a lot of money out of the system. And when that happens, you know, loans will dry up. And, and again, all of it fits together for the economy, but that's what we see with that. Yeah, well, to, to borrow your opening statement here, um, that there are a number of shoes that are sort of preparing to drop this year. I feel like we're identifying a number of them. And, and yet another one that you put up was um, profit margins, right? Which is they're still near all-time highs, as I believe it was Jeremy Grantham said, Profit margins are one of the most mean reverting data sets in all of finance. Um, and for a lot of the reasons you've already discussed about your concerns about the economy slowing, it, it just seems like, you know, we've tossed the ball up in the air and it's hovering there at its apex. And, and science just tells us it has to start coming down. So how big a deal do you think uh, reversion to the mean in earnings is going to be this year? Well, I think I think that's the one thing that Wall Street misses. Now, I've been watching them. I think I used uh, in the letter that the you know average on the street was two hundred thirty one dollars for uh, S and P on the street consensus. For us, we think it's less than two hundred somewhere. And some along that way, what happens is I think pe people forget about this. But look at all the inputs to public companies over the last 10 years, their financing kept going down and down, and down as far as the cost, you know, globalization helped them quite a bit. Well, that's going away now. Everybody's, everybody's saying, Hey, I'm pulling back into my country. Now that's going away. All of a sudden, you know, with inflation, people on the wage side are saying, Hey, I'm not going to work for that. You have to pay me more money if you want me in the loop here. So if you put everything and then cost of goods have gone up now, they obviously are coming down some on the commodity side right now. That's true. But if these other things stay up, OK, then you're going to be in a situation where those margins have to come down. I cannot see them not coming down more than people expect. So if the margin comes down, then the profit comes down and then the multiple comes down. And that's how we look at that, that three way. OK, yeah. And, and just to to make sure folks understand. Stocks are generally priced um, on, on two ways. You hear about the, the price to earnings ratio, right? So um, the price is a function of earnings. Um, so uh, usually there's a multiple that's placed on earnings, right? Uh, and we have seen some contraction over 2022, Ted, in terms of, of PE multiples. But, but you're saying, you know, there could be still more reason for the multiple to shrink. Um, and when that multiple shrinks, it brings the price down, it, assuming earnings are constant. But you're saying earnings are actually likely to be lower going forward than are currently expected. So even if the multiple remains the same, stock prices can come down as the earnings expectations shrink. So we've got sort of two factors that could be continuing to bring stock prices down next year, lower earnings than currently estimated, and also people getting worried and bringing that multiple down too, correct? That's correct. And I think what people forget to realize, let's just take a 4,000 number for the S&P 500. And let's say let's say let's say we happen to get it right at two hundred, not not lower than two hundred, just two hundred. Uh, you know that's still twenty times. Okay, that's not a cheap market by any stretch. That's mm -hmm. not cheap. And so at bear market lows, you usually go under the fourteen. You'll go to you know eleven, twelve, thirteen times. And and so when you start making these adjustments, I think that has to get priced in. And therein lies the fact that we think you have to you may not get it, but you have to be aware that there could be more significant weakness if those numbers keep on falling. 
Yeah, and, and I'm not saying you're necessarily calling for this, but if we if we if we have a 200 earnings per share on the S and P, and and we get to a bear market multiple of a 12 or 13, I mean that's sort of like in the high 2000s, right? I mean that that that's that's like a at least a 30 percent drop from where we are today. Yeah, and I think even if you said 15 times, I mean you're looking at 3,000 on the S and P, and I I I just think people uh, are not aware of what the numbers are. And they've been sold this mantra that don't worry about it. It's a long-term deal and you'll be fine. But I have I think I've told you this before, but I've always had a saying with all the portfolio managers at Oxbow that almost everybody is long-term if you talk to them until they lose money and then they're short-term. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's very true. And again, that's the value an advisor brings is, you know, as, as people, our, our emotions um, and our sense of, of under or overconfidence tend to be our very worst enemies here. And having a partner that can really ground you in, in reality and consistency can be a, a really big asset. Um, Ted, thank you so much for the time you've given us. I'm still I'm working my way towards your your uh, portfolio allocation. If you've got a few more minutes, um, sure. I'd, I'd love just to ask you one or two more things about your your investor update. Is that okay? Totally okay. I, I will say, this, uh, Adam, you've developed such a great show over the last few years, and I know you have a huge following. So uh, I, I'll do whatever whatever works for you. <laughs> You're much too kind, Ted. But thank you. Um, all right. Well, look. Um, uh, there's a chart that you showed that I think really underscores. Kind of the big risk that we're talking about here, um, and this is the chart of non-profitable tech um, from just the beginning of 2020 to now. So basically, past two years, right? And it has completely round tripped. Uh, it, it, it grew by more than 400 uh, percent, but is now off by almost 80 percent, and it's pretty much back where it started from two years ago. And and that's the math I think that most people just aren't doing there in their heads. And of course, this is an extreme example, but, you know, as recently as, as a, a little over a year ago, you know, folks thought that that was, index was going to increase by another 400%. They just could not conceive that it could drop, let alone even flatline. But of course, it's it's given up all those gains that it had since just the beginning of 2020. Well, it has. And, I, you know, I pull that off Bloomberg all the time uh, just so I can sort of look at it and see where it is. And, it, you know, it obviously is back to where it was. But it looks like now, though, it's going to go lower. You know, that it's actually going to go under where it was in 2020. And uh, that being the case. But there are so many companies I've never I never saw in my time in the business so many companies that were trading that didn't make any money. And I used to look, you know, a year and a half ago or so, I used to look at this ARC fund, that sort of thing. And I'd say, well, in my opinion, that's going to be like the Munder Net Net Fund. Now, for those that haven't been around a long time, that was the hottest thing going in 98, 99, 2000. And then over the course of a three-year period, they lost it all, 100% almost, went out of business. And so when you own all these companies, yeah, you know, you can say what they are, but you have to remember in investing, I don't care what investment it is. It could be any kind of investment, not just stocks and bonds. It's cash flow. You got to have cash flow. And so those com all those companies have no cash flow. And on top of that, they're burning all the cash they do have. And so that's, that's what they're up against right now. You know, you know, Ted, what's so important about that is, is you and I have known each other for enough years now that, um, I saw how you comported yourself during uh, th that massive melt up uh, in big tech. Um, I'm in particular thinking about Tesla, right? Which, um, you know, from a cash flow perspective, was valued at a gargantuan valuation versus its actual cash flows. Um, and then the whole Bitcoin uh, crypto uh, extreme boom as well. And um, I, I really, I really have to commend you for, you know, how you sort of just kept everything in perspective. And again, I think it's because you have the historical advantage of having seen versions of this movie before to not get caught up in the crazy FOMO that just sort of seems to infect the majority of the rest of the financial markets. Um, and I, I think having that grounding and that experience is, is so incredibly valuable because it is really hard 
for the average investor to resist that siren song, especially when so much of the official Wall Street, you know, in, you know, establishment is cheering that same thing on and basically selling them the message. If you don't get in now, you're going to be left behind. You don't understand it. Everything's different this time. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it's nece- it's not necessarily sexy to be the guy at the party saying, hey, everybody, I think we're, you know, we're overstaying our welcome here. The cops might be coming soon. But it's that kind of prudence that just saves, uh, you know, can be a lifesaver in terms of, of wealth protection. Well, one of the things I bring out in the piece that you're talking about, that with the magic of it all was get rich quick scheme. OK, you look at all those things they are just the same thing. OK, let me just bring an idea to you. It doesn't have to make any money and we'll throw it out there. People will like it and they'll buy it. But what happens, on, and, and I put a, a line in there, the reason it's magic is because now you see it and now you don't, <laughs> yeah. all right? And that's really what's happening right now. And um, I find it really interesting, and I, I'm, I'm, not an, I'm not an anti-crypto person. I just think that it's probably limited to just the upper group. I think, you know, I, I, I follow them, so I always know how many coins are out there. It got up over 10,000 at the high. Now it's down, you know, to 8,700 or something. But surely most of those are not going to do well. In fact, they haven't done well already. You know, they've lost 70, 80, 90, 100%. So uh, that's how we looked at that. But Wall Street picked up on it too when they when they did SPACs and they bought these companies and they did the funds where they were doing these startups. It it, it all folded together. And and I've I've been around too long. I know what I know what happens in those things. Um, well, look, uh, we mentioned this earlier. I'm going to put up the chart for it now. Um, but you know, you said, look, people are beginning to get nervous, right? They've 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 got the cuts and bruises of, of 2022 to prove it. Um, but what's interesting is, even given the outlook that you and I have just spent the past hour talking about, um, they're still positioned as if it's business as usual in the markets right now, right? People are still pretty much fully invested. They're still pretty, pretty long. Um, what do you think it's going to take for people to actually start changing their investment behavior? Well, I have a theory on it, really. And that is, if you look at most investors, 19, 20, and 2021, and you put those numbers together for the average person that was in um, ETFs or, or indexes or whatever, they did really well. And no, no question about it. And so what's happened is when you get the first down leg, which is, let's call it 25 or 30 percent, depending on how they're invested in those, it hasn't taken away enough of those three years yet to make them really get where they're like, you know, yeah, but I'm still mm-hmm. I still made money over the, you know, this period. I'm looking back to where I was at the, you know, the beginning of January 1 of 19. So that's to me, that's that's my theory of what's going on. That means that in order to really shake them out, you're going to have to go to a lower low where all of a sudden they look up and say, and now I'm really losing money. <laughs> and when that happens, they pull a trigger. And that right. that's what I think will happen. To, to use a relationship analogy, um, your girlfriend's not coming by anymore. She's not answering your calls, but you're still not willing to give up hope on the relationship until you actually see her dating another man, right? <laughs> that's that's true. And then even, even then, you know, don't believe your lying eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That happens too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, the reason why we, we brought the conversation to this point is because, um, Ted, you know, when I've had you on in the past, you've talked about how bear markets tend to end, right? And they tend to have a couple of different phases. And, and the last phase is sort of when people finally decide to believe their lying eyes and they just break the relationship. They break up with the markets. Right. They say, I don't uh, get me out. All right. I've lost way too much money. Just I want to sell it all. Don't even talk to me about stocks or bonds anymore. I just want to go nurse my wounds in a corner. I don't even want to touch these things ever again in my life. And I, I recall you saying that um, that they these bear markets tend to end with that last capitulation phase, which is where you sort of see like a like a sudden waterfall of like the last 25 percent of the drop happens pretty violently and quickly right at that end as everybody just kind of gives up on the market. And given current investor positioning, like we just talked about in that chart, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere close 
to that yet. So um, again, I want to take a pause here for a second because I'm going somewhere with this. Is, is that still the way you see it, which is that it's more likely that we still have kind of increasing downtrend and then a major capitulation event? For sure, because what 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 we see now, uh, and I do this from time to time, I'll just be around people that we don't do business with, but just say, how's it going out there in the marketplace or whatever? I just had one two days ago. And uh, she said, well, I had a million dollars in my 401k. She's a vendor for us. And she said, but now it's down to about, it's down to about 800 uh, or 795, something like that. And I said, uh, so you made any changes? She said, no, no, it'll, it'll, it'll come back. It'll come uh, back. I'm not too worried about it. And so I think that's the pretty much the mantra that's out there. So what has to happen is you have to get to a point where they say, now, look, I'm not, I'm not going to lose any more money. And, and, uh, and that's, unfortunately, that is the plight of the smaller individual investor. They have nobody to really help them say, okay, you need to get liquid here and then put it in here. And they, you know, it's just, they're, they're unfortunately, um, they don't get good advice. And I think that's what's happening right now.